And our next talk is, our invited speaker is Ashutosh Saxena from Cornell, and he'll be talking about RoboBrain, scaling the learning for grafting and manipulation plans. All right, hello everyone. Um, I've been presenting these ideas about uh, RoboBrain in different <laughs> workshops, and I will be talking more about it in my early career keynote on Wednesday. But in this talk, I will try to present something that I'm um, super interested in, which is grasping and manipulation problem. And um, that the topic of this talk, I will talk about how can we uh, build learning algorithms, uh, which is part of the talk. But the more interesting aspect is just showing off some very recent work from our lab, which is trying to scale uh, some of these grasping and manipulation problems up. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just uh, like an ongoing work. It, it's like an uh, effort that we are trying to do. So it's not super uh, final yet. Um, let's see. So just to give an overview of what we have been doing in our lab um, uh, at, at, uh, at the robot learning lab, uh, we try to learn very good representations from, uh, from different sources of data for the robots. So we look at natural language, because there is a lot of natural language on the internet. Um, people have written recipes online telling how to perform things. Like if you want to open a container, there is a wiki how page telling you how to open a container. Um, and if you want to eat a banana, there is a wiki how recipe on how to eat a banana. So um, uh, for, for people like us who work in manipulation, we should be trying to make use of such data. So this is some example of a user giving us on how to make uh, sweet tea by heating it up. So this statement is just trying to explain how to do it. So can we use this data? Um, then obviously, there is a lot of physical interaction. Um, when we are building a learning algorithm, like a ro robo brain that the effort uh, we are doing, um, every single physical interaction of the robot with the real world, whether it is with on a manipulation perspective or with a human, signal from that should be used for learning uh, whatever we are trying to learn. And I'm going to, in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on this part of the work. Um, but I've been also looking at images and videos and learning about how can robots perform tasks by watching people in videos doing things. Or just by going online and downloading 3D images and and then trying to learn from that. So just, um, um, so just to uh, give a very brief overview of one of the works that we have done in this domain is a software that we have built which can take a 3D point cloud. So you can have a Kinect sensor, and the robot can go around. It can build a 3D point cloud. Um, and it can label each part in the scene with these items, such as it's an electronic item. It could be a fridge. If the robot wants to open the fridge to get something out, that that image is a fridge. So it can perform manipulation actions. So from a perception point of view, getting these labels is very interesting. Um, so our software can take such a point cloud, uh, and it applies some vision algorithms to segment this point cloud, the 3D point cloud, into these small segments. Um, and the goal is to label these segments. And we use a conditional random field that can look at the image features, 3D shape, and other properties like object parts and objects to figure out what object that is. So it's a very principled learning algorithm. It has only one free parameter, which is only one free parameter that, um, that you need to tune. Um, and it can label objects in the environment. And there's the RSS paper, which is going to be present, presented tomorrow um, about um, 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 this paper on which the robot is going around and is trying to detect objects. And it can perform some manipulation. In this case, this is a four-year-old video when the Kinect just came out. So we were able to have it running on the robot so it can label things with different objects, as you see here. Now we have been doing more manipulation uh, with these labels, which is the purpose of this RSS paper. If you want to use this software, you should feel free to go ahead and download if you need it for your manipulation purposes. We are trying to make it easier for people to use. It's already in use by some companies like Qualcomm, Google, a healthcare venture, and so on, and other research universities. One of the things that led this uh, project to succeed very well was scaling. We were actually able to go and collect a lot of data by having holding a uh, sensor, the Kinect sensor, and just walking around in the building, and then putting the data online and asking people to label it, or even in an unsupervised setting. So learning algorithms work very well for this labeling task when there is good data to work with it. Uh, and that we have seen in many other domains in machine learning, natural language processing, 
image classification. They are all winners because we have so much data. It's speech recognition. Like every time you speak your cell phone on to Siri or some other Android, it's, it's a data-driven system. So next thing that we wanted to do was to figure out um, if we have a goal such as grasping, where we have to grasp a lot of objects, different kinds of objects that the robot may not have seen before. How can we enable robots, different kinds of robots, such as PR2, Baxter, or industrial robots to cap learn these objects and learn how to pick up these objects? Which is challenging because every object looks very different, so how do we learn to factor out the variations and only retain the features related to grasping? Because if you're trying to grab something, what is more important is to figure out what, what is the property that makes it a good grasp. Um, the second part is uh, path planning, which is the purpose of this talk. talk. Um, most of the work in path planning, historically, not the few recent works, have been about geometric path planning, where the goal of path planning is, um, well, avoid an obstacle and be as smooth as possible. That's the primary criteria for most of these um, works on, uh, on path planning. And I will describe that when the robots are trying to work in human environments, and not only our work, more recent works in HRI and some of the belief space planning community has shown that uh, it is extremely important to be able to reason about the environment in order to do um, relevant planning. You want to plan for the right thing. Um, so how do we formulate these problems as data-driven learning problems? How, how can we get data from tens or hundreds of demonstrations to thousands or millions of demonstrations? That is one of the goals of my research lab. Because I strongly believe that if we are able to do that, then our learning algorithms that I saw some of the posters here or other works in the community can, can do really good if we have that kind of data. Uh, so, the, so the first attempt we did was um, on this grasping work um, where the goal was to uh, work with RGBD data. Um, and, and, and we were trying to figure out uh, how can we enable the robots to grasp a large variety of objects. Um, so there was some recent work in the past, including my own back in 2006, where we built a machine learning algorithm. You can compute certain features from the images or the 3D data and use a classifier to figure out uh, which are good areas to grab. So it becomes an object detection problem at the first step. So if you want to grab this remote, uh, this would be a good way to grab it. But if you try to grab it in this way, that would be a bad way, um, right? Um, one of the limitations of this work was that we were hand engineering the features. Um, uh, I myself sat down and said, uh, design these edge detectors and different kind of features to figure out these are the features that are good for grasping, and le let's learn a mapping from these uh, from these features to this rectangle that can that can do the trick. Um, because once you know where it is, one can use a standard path planner to go here and close the gripper and grab it. So we have converted this problem for the whole grasping motion planning problem into two parts. Figure out where you want to grab it, and the second part is figure out how do you go there. Um, so in this recent work, we wanted to uh, solve the following problem. We did not want it, um, grad students to design the features because uh, we thought that that's a waste of time. Um, um, on, on designing these features. So we said, okay, what do we do? Um, so we applied a idea called deep learning, um, which I'm going to describe in a second. Um, and, and remember, here we are trying to grasp a really, the focus is to have the robot grasp new objects that it has not seen before. But if you know the rough shape of the object, then you can figure out how would you grab it. So um, the goal here is that we will start with an image. We want to learn a feature-based representation from the pixels to figure out how do we map it to a good rectangle, which is here in this case where it is possible to grasp. So we used a multi-layer deep learning network to score the grasp, and we had some interesting structural regularization to enable the learning algorithm to work from multimodal data. Um, so in previous works in deep learning, uh, people often deal with multiple modalities in many ways. So in robotics, we often deal with a variety of different data, images, 3D data, tactile sensors, and so on. Um, so in deep learning, people often deal with one kind of data. So there are many ways to handle multiple types of data. 
One thing we tried doing was a simple concatenation, where we take the different modes, which is the images and depth, and you simply append them as the input. All the pixels, put them together, and try to learn a joint representation. Um, that did not work very well. Um, second idea is to learn features separately for two different modes, but that tries to ignore the dependency between uh, two different types of mode. In our work called structural regularization, it allows some interconnections uh, using sparsity, but it also tries to learn independent representations for the image channel and the depth channel. Because image tells you something about what is a good area to grasp based on the texture. Depth tells you something, but there's also some uh, interdependency between the two. Um, framing the problem in this domain in this, in this manner uh, was, very, it was very, very useful because all we had to do is to just give it an unsupervised data set of a bunch of images, 3D images of, the, of different types of object. So we have a coronal grasping data set in which we have 280 different objects uh, in this fashion. Um, and uh, uh, by looking at this kind of data uh, and using deep learning algorithms, we have figured out our learning algorithm has figured out these compact representations from, from these images. And these are a few samples that it has learned. So this is shown in only in the depth channel. Um, and, uh, and we looked at which features that it has learned correspond to positive grasp and negative grasp after it has learned them. And you can see that some of them actually look quite reasonable. Sorry, my slides are progressing automatically for some reason. Um, so for example, this one is a very common grasp, and we figured out which uh, thing does it correspond to quite often. And this one actually correspond to um, like a martini glass or vases that go like this. So um, cups or thinner glasses that extend up. So this feature corresponds to that object. This corresponds to uh, simple stems or cylinders. Can anyone guess what this corresponds to? Where the robot is trying to guess? Handles. Mug handles, so that's the highest correlation feature that we have found. These are some negatively correlated features that were found. Um, so th the one thing that was cool, f we, were ex we were very interested in uh, this work, that I was personally very excited, is that by converting the grasping problem into something equivalent to object detection in the image domain, we were able to use the data and, and, and uh, increase the performance of the grasping um, significantly. So this is the best hand design features that my student Yun Jiang could come up uh, in 2011 paper, 58.3%. Uh, uh, and then when we use deep learning, it improved it significantly to 75% uh, performance on, on grasping. Um, I think this data set has a still a lot of a scope for improvement um, to improve the deep learning. This was a paper in RSS last year, and the details are in that paper. So moving on to the second part of my talk, um, uh, which is manipulation, uh, let us try to figure out how can we um, convert the manipulation problem into a data-driven problem. So any, any ideas before I actually describe my talk, like how would you do it? We all, all heard about some of the efforts in different labs, like Drew Bagnell has been uh, driving his 2D big robots around CMU to collect data for investment, reinforcement learning. Peter Abiel's group has been collecting some data for, for such some of these things. Jan Peter has been taking his ping pong balls and doing that um, daily. I talked to his graduate students. They have been doing that for over a month um, um, to, to learn how to, uh, have you, you know, everyone, how many people know about that work? I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, you to, uh, take the ping pong ball and you have to catch it. So what graduate students have to do is they have to make it catch for, for a month to, to train for that task. Um, um, and the robot can learn from those demonstrations. Uh, my advisor, Andrew Ng, and Peter Abiel, historically, they have been flying these helicopters and learning from that. But those are expert demonstrations. You need an expert or some minions to keep on doing it all the time, um, which is not, not a lot of fun. Uh, I did that uh, four years back. I was uh, trying to mm, uh, do drive a robot car with some vision. So I, I, I was building this simulator, labeling these data sets. So uh, that, that is the effort. Any, any ideas how could we scale it up from thousands or hundreds of demonstrations to millions? 
crowdsourcing is one way, and um, this is where we are going. So, um, and there are, there have been some recent works, very good recent works in this space, um, including uh, some other research lab and our own. Um, and then the, the key idea is that crowdsourcing is a noisy system from which you are learning, so you need um, better algorithms. But what we have been looking at is if you can combine different forms of feedback to the manipulation planning system, um, you can get some good data to learn from, you can get some noisy data to good learn from, and you can get some corrections to learn from. And by putting them all together with the algorithm that has guarantees, um, the one can achieve pretty good performance. Um, so let's take a particular problem at hand, um, which is path planning. Let's, let's not talk about motion planning. Let's not talk about anything else. Let's ignore um, uncertainty in the perception. We can always combine them by converting that to belief space. Just for the sake of uh, illustration, let us say the problem is simply taking this egg carton and uh, moving it here. Uh, a path planning problem. Find out the motion path in the in the joint space of this Baxter robot, which is a seven degree of freedom arm, and make it go from one point to another. Uh, once we, uh, I was actually new to motion planning until two years back. So we said, okay, let's take the best pl planner from CMU, from Berkeley, from Georgia Tech, and just run it on this problem. Um, so the realized that the, the, the about since about last two decades, the goal of path planning has been um, there are two goals of path planning on which to optimize is optimized. The first goal is to avoid the obstacles, uh, right? The second goal is to have as much smoothness or minimum energy, minimum jerk, whatever the criteria is. And that is the criteria that path planners optimize for. So when we ran it, we got this curve, this blue curve, um, that was the output of the algorithm. Um, so um, I don't know how many of you have tried to use the standard path planner for tasks. This is a very common scenario when you see robots doing these funny things all the time uh, for doing manipulation tasks. And we all end up hacking um, uh, to build these demos because we want them to look good for different sponsors and putting it online. So when we were first doing it, my student Ashish Jain said, OK, this is looking very bad. What do I do? So he said, OK, I'm going to put a hard constraint that it should be always upright and I'm going to hard code into the planner, and let's see what it gives. Um, just to make it look good, right? Like we were trying to move egg cartons. So this is how this blue thing actually looked. Um, but, but the ideal answer for this is actually this. If I ask a human to move a egg carton, he, will, he does not care about the obstacles. Um, he, he will just move it like this way, from one point on the table to another. Um, and one can argue, like, big deal, I could also hard code this, and I could also um, just uh, figure out what this means. But the problem is that every object has such a very different behavior. There are so many situations that we cannot possibly hard code for any situation. And even surprising thing is that um, if I change the configuration or the location of this egg carton even by three centimeters or three inches, the paths just change drastically. Um, so that's how path planners work often. They, they, because if you change the location of the object, the robot planners have to do something else, and they come up with weird paths again, and you start hacking up again. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in situations where uh, you set up a demo, and uh, someone changes something a little bit, and everything breaks down, right? <laughs> uh, and you're like, ah. So when you build the demos, you put these shift markers, and you ask, no one touches it. Um, my experiment is running. Uh, we have been all there, all, all there for a long time. So what we did was we uh, took our work from object affordances work um, by Yun Jiang and Hima Kopila, two of my PhD students. And what we tried to build was a learning system that reasons about objects. Because the path planning, grasping, and everything is supposed to be done on objects. So if you know that some object has a particular label, maybe you can make it behave differently. Like if you know something is drinkable, you can take that drinkable and define a constraint saying, well, drinkable means it contains something, so don't tilt it. Otherwise, it would be a mess. But if it's something like a newspaper or a book, it's OK to tilt it. Um, and by the way, you cannot put it the hardest constraint in the planner always. Because if you try to keep everything upright and slow and safe, you cannot plan anything. Um, um, so this, this, was, this is a good start. Um, 
The second thing that we wanted to do was to figure out how can we include grasping and interactions into our uh, knowledge representation. So we, we have been learning these affordances by watching people how they interact with objects. So for example, in this case, we have a lot of models of uh, microwaves and many other objects. And we see people how they interact. And this is simply showing a uh, probability histogram of what is the most likely place where people touch it. Um, and some, most of the times they touch it here. Um, sometimes they touch it on the top, because some microwaves have a little ledge on the top. Uh, this would allow a robot to do the right thing when needed. So if the goal is to put some plan for something to put into the microwave, it may actually use this piece of information. And, and then final thing is we also need to reason about how to exactly move. So we have been also learning these trajectories um, using a nice probability model. Um, just for a quick fun, some of you have may have seen my other talk uh, this morning. Um, can anyone guess what this heat map is for? Oh, uh, lifting. So as you can see, the task or intention or the goal for the robot will define how it is interacting with the objects. So it's extremely important to have some knowledge of the intent when you're trying to plan certain tasks. Um, let us see. Uh, so how do we use that in path planning? So the trick here is to define a cost function, which actually turns out to be a conditional random field-based cost function, where what we did was to uh, take this trajectory y, this, so this is the trajectory y that is supposed to be planned in the robot uh, mobile manipulation phase. It could be a different robot. We have been running it on two, three different robots. For the sake of argument, let us say this is a seven degree of freedom arm, so this would be a seven degree angle configuration, y1 to yn. Um, and during this trajectory, the, some objects would be moved in a certain way. It would be moving close to a human sometimes, close to other objects sometimes. So this cost function represents the score that we want to give it to the trajectory while, while learning this system. Um, so, so this is a use of um, the knowledge about the objects um, into, the, into the form of a cost function, which is expressed over a graph. So now, now this is the cost function we want to learn. The question is, how do we learn it? So um, uh, some famous examples that algorithm we all know is um, to learn such kind of cost functions or reward functions is um, inverse reinforcement learning or learning by demonstration. So those could actually help learn this cost function. We can actually ask users to demonstrate uh, these trajectories to people, and we can learn from that. And there has been good work in that. Um, for example, uh, uh, Drew Bagnell's lab, uh, Ratliff, has been driving this robot around to demonstrate what is a good way to drive a robot around. And I talked about this one. Um, and I talked about this helicopter. The problem is that this does not let you scale because you need experts to do these things. Um, when my colleague Peter Abiel back at Stanford, uh, he was trying to get expert demonstration for a robot, he had to hire an expert pilot whose rate was like $50 an hour just to fly that toy helicopter. Uh, he did it for fun um, at a low rate, but he had to schedule everything and uh, invest ev almost every single one of his weekends to get that pilot to fly the helicopter for him. He could not himself fly the helicopter, by the way. Uh, only the expert could. Um, the challenge here is that how do we actually go beyond this optimal demonstrations? Uh, because for most of the planning problems, we want to learn from normal users who may be disconnected from the real world. It may be still be useful to get some expert demonstration, but for scaling it up, we can only get non-expert users. So we have uh, uh, developed this new learning setting called coactive learning, where the setting is that the robot and the user None of them know the right answer, yes. Um, so none of them know the right answer, and the goal is for them to together discover what is the right answer. So the setup would look like the robot will propose some trajectories to the user, and the user can correct them. Uh, it doesn't need to tell the robot the right answer, the algorithm the right answer. As long as it is correcting them uh, into the uh, it, as long as they are correcting them a little bit in expectation, this algorithm is guaranteed uh, to converge, and it has guarantees on regret. 
and it, the identity looks similar asymptot in asymptotically to the inverse reinforcement learning. What that actually means is that this work proves that as long as the signal that the user is providing, on an average, it is better than what the robot is doing right now, you can converge to the optimum. You never need an optimal demonstration, and you don't need a slightly correct demonstration always. Sometimes the users can make mistakes. Um, this is different from inverse reinforcement learning and learning by demonstration, where the assumption is there is the right answer, there could be noise around it. This, in this our case, the assumption is that there is never an expert demonstration. And here is uh, a, a practical uh, demonstration uh, showing the person actually correcting the robot's behavior. <laughs> so we taught the robot how to deal with eggs, and we gave it a knife. It didn't work very well. <laughs> um, so it is trying to move it close to the table, see? And now the person is trying to correct it, and now it will have data to actually uh, learn from this kind of corrective behavior. Note that the person did not give it the right answer. It just corrected part of the trajectory. And now this feedback can come in these different forms. It doesn't need to execute it physically. It can just propose these results, just like a search engine proposes you search results, and you click on the third one to choose the more relevant one. The trajectory improves. Um, and this is after three rounds of feedback. Um, the <laughs> robot could <laughs> improve. And now the situation has changed significantly. The person is in a different location, not in front of it. There are other objects around. But through this learning process, even in this constraint manipulation scenario, it can come up with these trajectories. And we have been testing that on a lot of data set, and we are getting consistent behavior as our theory predicts. Now we want to move on and scale it up. Um, so far, it is still learning from uh, non-expert users. So it is better than expert demonstration because it is corrective. Um, the problem is someone has to physically come in the lab to correct the robot and so on. So what we have done is actually develop this fun system called Planet. Um, and in this Planet system, it's a Netflix-like -like rating system. We tell you a situation, and robot does something. All you have to do is to like the video or not like the video or parts of the video, which is very easy feedback for what we have found. Asking for Turkers or anyone else to do more is a significant time investment. And this can take a few seconds. They just look at a video in 10, 15 seconds, then they can give the video feedback. It goes back to our system, uh, and it can learn uh, how to do it. They don't have to think much. It's much easier for people to say, I like this, I don't like this. But if you ask them to explain what it is, it, it is a much stronger time investment. So we have shown that with even with this kind of a uh, learning system with weak feedback um, by showing them to the person, we can update the parameters and, and learn these good representations. So two minutes. Um, so we have been uh, learning on a lot of manipulation and navigation scenarios. And uh, uh, you should check it out, Planet. Uh, Google Planet or go to planet.cs.com.edu. Every time you play this game, it would be fun. Um, so last part is we wanted to also do one level up planning. So this was like motion path planning. We want to do actually task level planning. So we have this effort that we just uh, uh, re uh, released called Tell Me Dave. It's a paper in RSS this year. Um, here we want to ground the natural language into sequence of motion plans. So instead of just correcting one motion, we want to actually convert this, which is place the, some natural language instruction, and figure out how would the person do it. Much, much larger problem, because now you have to talk about sequence of plans that make sense, that relate to the language, and make sense in the environment. Environment can change every time. The, maybe the store is in a different location. Something else is in a different location. So you want to map this to the uh, symbolic plans and also relate that to the physical trajectories. So our learning algorithm in Tell Me Dave can take this natural language and the environment, and through a graphical model, uh, it can uh, it can learn, and the way we learn here is if you uh, go to Tell Me Dave uh, and play a first person video game and type natural language, then uh, then it it learns from it. So what we have people do is we tell them what do you want to do. They say oh there was a person say I wanted to I like Italian dessert affogato I want to make that. So we downloaded some uh, ice cream affogato into the 3D model. And then they went into the game and played this game. 
um, of making the SOGA2. So what is being shown here is that robot now, person is speaking, and now it can make SOGA2 in a new environment by converting to this kind of recipes. So it, we started in the current RSS paper, we had four tasks, making ramen, making SOGA2, making something, four tasks. And now there are 10 tasks and about 1,000 um, demonstrations thousand demonstrations of this task. And every day people are actually adding this data set to perform the task. So to wrap up, um, I think it, personally for me, I'm very interested in how we can learn about grasping and motion plans by scaling through these semi-online systems, but also augmenting it with real data and, and see how, how it goes. Um, so thank you. Yes. Uh, so the deployment and grasping stuff, uh, do you include the image channels as two different modalities, or is it just one, one big modality? Ah, so that was the key uh, new algorithmic change in this work. If we treat them as all as one modality, it doesn't work very well. Um, if we treat them as completely different modalities, it doesn't work very well either. Yes. I, Uh, we took, took them all as same, uh, uh, RGB were all, all the same. Actually, we may have converted RGB to some HUV space, uh, gray scale and color space. All right. All right, thank you. Bye.